The FBI uh, convinced me that I was a fool, and they were 100% right. They were doing it to me, and not just in the federal cases, in the state cases. They had informers going in on me and making it miserable for me. Uh, they wanted to give me 100 years in a case up in Boston. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mr. The mob really wanted to get rid of you, didn't they? Oh, they did. Yeah. And they stole all my money when I went away. They stole your money when you went yeah. away besides? So I couldn't allow that. So the FBI showed me where I was wrong. The FBI is smart people. They showed me where they I was wrong. They convinced you that you were being made the victim. That's right. By the people whom you had befriended and worked with. They convinced me that it was just a question of time before they killed me. Mm -hmm. And they were right. If I didn't do what I was doing now, I mean, I would have eventually get killed in prison. That's the, that's the final judgment and that's disposition, right. is it, of this mob? That's it. Get you out of the way completely so you don't cause no more trouble. Mm -hmm. Very well, you why, uh, why did they want to do that to you? You were a pretty good uh, operator for them, weren't you? But my people went to jail. Henry Tamilio and Raymond Patriarch were in jail, see? I see. Uh, before I went away. So I had no one fighting for me anymore out there. If that happens, can't you make a deal with another mob outfit and get in with them? No, you can't trust them. They're a shady bunch of characters. <laughs> 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 and who was in it with you? Well, I just worked there. I see. Henry Tamilio, Carlo Mastatorio, uh, Danny Montavano, Joe Black, and just about, I guess that was about it. In other words, the big mobsters were the ones that really owned this thing. You sent down every month. Okay. I am now uh, from these cases. He run away. They haven't found him yet. Mm -hmm. Been gone over a year. Why did you hire this uh, need for five hundred dollars a week? I wanted him to be close to me. He was a sucker. I wanted to keep him close to me. Uh, every time he built up another supply of money, we'd knock him out <laughs> for another thirty, forty thousand. He was a really good source of. Oh, he was a beauty. If you had three like him, you'd never have to work. <laughs> <laughs> Where did he get all the money? He had some trotters, uh, horses, and race horses. Yeah. And I guess he used to get real lucky at the horses. Uh -huh. I don't know what he done. I don't know whether he bagged them or what. I don't know. What jobs? Right. Or well, do you have any idea of uh, how many uh, stolen securities you dealt in during your career? How many career? Have, have I handled myself? Yes, that's right. I probably looked at 25 or 30 million dollars worth. Well, you had some, some dealings with, with respect to 25 or 30 million dollars worth? I didn't deal with all of them. A lot of them I just didn't want no part of. They were too hot. They were presented to you? Yes. And they, in the main, they came from uh, brokerage concerns. Well, uh, yeah, but the bulk of them later on, uh, we get into, came from mail robberies and airport robberies. Came from where? Airport robberies and mail robberies. Yes, well, now, before they got into that phase of the stolen well, security Most of my racket, stuff came out of the vaults, yes. How many, what percentage then came from, uh, from I the would say inside about, uh, jobs from the broker's vaults? About two, three million dollars worth. Or you think that these stolen securities have uh, had any uh, relationship to the number of brokerage concerns that either failed or had to be taken over by some of their competitors? Well, I know one company that we put out of business ourselves up in Boston that they just couldn't stand the loss. And which one was that? Dempsey Tegler Company. We well, beat now, them for 600000 in a month cash money and they just couldn't stand it they went out of business how much how much was involved six hundred thousand and it failed they failed yes sir and what was the name of that concern Dempsey Tegla well now the name of the firm of uh, uh, Hayden Stone has been mentioned by other witnesses at this hearing was that the one that uh, most of the securities was stolen from yeah, Maryland, Fenner Pierce, and Hayden Stone. But Hayden Stone was the bulk of it. 
Well, now, how many people working for Hayden Stone were engaged in the business of trafficking in, in stolen securities? I haven't got the slightest idea. Well, did I, you I, have I, any direct dealings with any of them? No, I dealt always secondhand. I never dealt with anyone in the brokerage firm. I dealt through Jack Mace, Arthur Tortorella, Skinny Freddy, Bobby Cadillo, Freddy Sano, who all had connections with the brokerage firms, Butch Maselli, but I never dealt with anyone direct from the brokerage firm. Well, now, how did you determine whether a security was uh, what you refer to as being hot or cold? Well, we had a man in a, an office in Boston. Uh, I don't recall the name of the office right now. You know, brokerage firm that I would call up and give him a code name and say, this is uh, George White calling or some such name. Uh, <laughs> laughing about that <laughs> Well, anyway, we'd give him a name and give him the numbers and the, the certificates and so forth, uh, and the names, and he would call me back in a matter of an hour or so, and he'd check them on a list that they have there and see if they were hot or cold. Well, you'd have to pay more for cold security than for hot security. I wouldn't take right? hot security. They were no good to me. You wouldn't deal in them at all? No. For them, uh, as soon as you went to a bank with them, if the bank was on the up, they check their list and you're in trouble. As I recall, you testified to start with about uh, counterfeit securities, but it looks like you abandoned dealing in counterfeit securities because it's easier to get them out of the safe from insiders, inside brokerage concerns. Is that correct? Yes, sir. They were bad investment. So you had genuine securities, but they... Uh, had been stolen. Yes, sir. They went on any stolen list when I got them. I I've see. seen a lot that were on a stolen list and wouldn't take them. Well, now, how many stolen securities have you or hypothecated? Well, Did the Confederates pay him anything for information or just for security? I paid my man in the book was for, him, for information. All according for anywhere from $50 to $150. It's all according to what kind of information he was giving me. I see. Well, now to make sure that they were handling good, clean stock. Well, now, there were other uh, gangsters, uh, uh, members of the mob, who were dealing with these same uh, all over the crooks country. inside the brokerage offices, were they not? Yes. They would call me, and I would call into this fellow. His first name was Frank. And uh, I would say, look, I want to find out about this particular stock that was stolen out of Chicago. Is there any list on it? And he'd come back and say, yes, there is or there isn't. And if there wasn't, you could go to work on it. If there was, give them back to the man that gave them to you, that's all. And for this, you would, we would pay him anywhere from 50 to $150. Well, are some of these same insiders still operating uh, on the street? It was when I went away, yes. Well, if you furnish the... Uh investigators the names of these individuals? The name is in my telephone book, uh, which is in the hands of the uh, United States Strike Force, I believe. Uh, name and uh, telephone numbers of these people that uh, I used to call. I see. His home number and his office. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And uh, this is the front for him to uh, do his operations there. You mean Silva stolen illegally? Jack Mason is probably the biggest fence on the whole East Coast. And this is where he used to do most of his fencing, in the air and between there and the jewelry center. What does he fence? Everything. Jewelry, trail loads of cigarettes, liquor, trail loads of razor blades, you name it. Furs. What would you say his income would be in the course of a year from his fencing activities? Well over a million dollars. The man's a millionaire in cash. That's rich. Oh. He certainly is. He, when, when, you're a millionaire in, when you're a millionaire in cash, that's rich. Does he ever file any income taxes or anything, yeah? I imagine he must. He's down as a jewelry salesman. Uh huh. But he's the biggest fence on the East Coast, you say? To my knowledge. Okay. Thank you. I believe uh, Jack Mace is in jail now. He's well, in what? Atlanta. In Atlanta? Yes, sir. Oh, you know what charges? He got uh, ten. Of, I got him in Baltimore 
for this particular case, later on when I cooperated with the government, 15 years. He's been convicted on yes. your testimony. Uh, three times already. A what? Three different cases already. Uh, three different convictions yes. that you testified against him. Right. How many other convictions have, have uh, law enforcement officials secured out by reason of your testifying? Do you know? Approximately uh, either 18 or 20, I'm not sure. 18 or 20 different convictions. Yes. How do honest people get their due? Maybe, well, maybe, I tell that, you, maybe uh, there's something to that. The Canziano brothers, Frankie and Gus of Brooklyn, who also deal with the stolen securities. It was common knowledge that the Canziano was associated with with the organized crime family of Joe Colombo in Brooklyn, and I had access to many millions of dollars of stolen securities. I received securities from the Candianos on many occasions, but I'd always turned them back to them as they were always too hot to handle. In the later part of January 1969, I went to Frank, with, with Frank Candiano to an empty apartment in, building, in a building in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn and spent approximately five hours going through a closet full of stolen securities. After going through these securities, I took $5 million with the Gulf and Western Industry stock, which was part of a multi-million dollar theft from J.F. Kennedy International Airport. Shortly afterwards, shortly after that, I left New York City and returned to Boston area. I turned over the $5 million in Gulf and Western stock to a man named Bernie, who was in the air conditioning business in Sunville, Massachusetts. He in turn turned them over to a man named Antonio from Venezuela with the intentions of investing these securities in coffee futures. The deal was this. We gave him $5 million in securities. He in turn would negotiate a deal which was, <coughs> excuse me, which we would get $4 million in coffee futures and $4 million would be whacked up between Bernie and myself. Shortly after this, I started serving my prison sentence and I have no knowledge what happened to these securities. Who is this bear you mentioned here in New Jersey? He's a fellow named, uh, they call him the bear. His name is Frank Batzel from Newark, New Jersey. And he's one of the organized crime Yes, people? he's with uh, Joe Paterno's mob over there. What uh, kind of a job does he have with him? Is he one of the key factors? Well, he, uh, he's with an assassination group over there. You mean he uh, gets paid for knocking people off? That's it. He was with the same group that Butch Maselli was with. How much would they pay him to do that? They got paid, uh, this is actually all they were supposed to do. They got paid so much every week for sitting around and just waiting for them to call them up. About how much? Uh, Butch was telling me he was getting $1,000 a week. I don't know whether to believe him or not. Would he get extra then if he got a job? I never asked him. I would imagine he did. Mm -hmm. Plus they had this counterfeit scheme going here. I bought counterfeit money off him years ago, and they had counterfeit securities and counterfeit, well, you name it, anything you wanted, postage stamps. How much would a character, how many people would a character like that kill during the course of a year? Any idea? As many as he had to. But, I mean, do you have any idea how many numbers? Well, that's hard to say. If there was a war going on, he might dump a dozen guys. Then again, he might not dump any. In the course of a year, a dozen. Uh -huh. Possible. Tell me, what can you give us a little more information on this counterfeit operation? I mean, how many people would they employ? You say they can print anything? Anything you want. Just give them time enough to make it up. Now, where... They used to do a photo engraving machines. What, what kind of a... I mean, how many uh, people do they have in this print shop? Well, I don't know where the print shop is. I see. I mean, you've done everything. He would, he would make you up Massachusetts licenses and... Uh, uh, Massachusetts registration and uh, bill of sales for cars and uh, passports, birth certificates. Anything at all? Anything you wanted. You have any idea how much? For three weeks. You mean either counterfeit or stolen? Either counterfeit or stolen. After three weeks, they see there's, there's a list sent out once monthly, and then there's a list sent out every week. Mm -hmm. Now, you can normally escape with a legitimate or credit card or a counterfeit one, for three weeks, but after three weeks, you're on borrowed time because it's going to start popping up and it's going to be on that monthly list. See. Did you have, uh, were you ever tipped off in advance? On yeah, we things? had a couple of places that we used to call and give them the number of the card that we had in the name, and they would tell us if this card was on the list yet. And these would be connections into the, say, American Express Company or right. some of the others? Right, well, they would get a list. 
yeah. from the American Express Company weekly, telling them what was hot and what wasn't. Oh, I see. Now, if it wasn't on that list, you had another week to wear. How much did you have to pay these fellows? Well, it wasn't so much that you paid them. They were usually head waiters in restaurants. When you went in, instead of tipping them $5, you gave them $25. Oh, I see. It was more or less the favor they were doing for you. Oh, I see. How many of these did you have working for you? Well, we had uh, two in Miami and uh, one or two in Boston. Mm-hmm. One final question on this uh, bear, Basto. From your description, I'd say you'd call him a hitman. Is that what they call these fellows? Yes. Okay, thank you. I obviously can't conclude uh, this morning. Uh, we had it insured for about $120,000. We only paid $55,000 for it. So we had set it up to burn it down just the day before Labor Day so it looked legitimate. So I lit the fire, and my partner had fell in love with this place. He was fooling around with girls and everything, and he enjoyed it. And I lit the fire, and the fire is starting to go on. He's throwing sand on it. <laughs> I'm throwing kerosene, he's throwing sand. <laughs> Who won the argument, anyway? Finally, I said, go ahead, keep it. And he put the fire out, and that was it. We, we later lost the place in bankruptcy three years later. Is that what you call a, a bust-out situation? That was a bust-out. Yeah. And it was a real bust-out. We lost our money. <laughs> but you never were able to burn it down. I no, think. not after that. He didn't even try anymore. Okay. All right. <coughs> Leaders. Haiti. We had an end down there with Papa Doc, the president of Haiti. Papa Doc the value that we could get a gambling license anytime we wanted. I gave Papa Doc a Cadillac. We were propositioned by Joe Kirk, who was running a casino there for the boys, to build a hotel or casino to yeah. see if we could find anyone with money. I called Joe Swartz and explained, and he sounded very interested. I made an appointment for him to meet in Boston. Joe Swartz came to Boston, but Joe Kirk never showed up. He was busy. Joe Swartz went back, and we decided we would all go to Haiti. I got, I got hold of Raymond Patriarca. He was to have Joe Kirk get in touch with me in the meeting. And so what, it, uh, what would 15% amount to in some of these games? Well, they could go home with... Uh, I've seen games where they went home with 15 grand for their end. For how long work? A uh, couple of days. Mm-hmm. Well paid, in other words. I would say so. Yeah, I would too. Good. <clears throat> Bobby Cadillo had received $53,000 worth of stolen Jefferson County school bonds from Skinny Freddie Garino of New York City. They wanted to know if I could move them. Skinny Freddie had a big connection in two or three different joints in Wall Street, where he gets his stocks and bonds. One place where he was well connected was Hayden and Stone and Company. In fact, most of the stuff he gets, he disposes of through customers in Montreal, Canada, the Bahamas, and make fr- frequent trips carrying shopping bags filled with stone stocks and bonds. Well, now, explain to the committee about these connections where he could get his stocks and bonds. What do you mean by that? Well, he had connections with guys that were working right in the brokerage firms. And uh, they would call him and say, well, you need some stock. I'll take some out for you. What kind do you need? Mm-hmm. And he would give them orders for what he wanted, you know, like I want IBM or I want DuPont. And they would steal it out of the vault. Now, when they give him this stock, it's the same thing uh, like uh, giving him a license to steal for a couple of months. In other words, he didn't have any problems at all in getting anything he needed. All anything. he wanted. What would he pay these people in these brokerage firms? From what I understand, I don't know personally. Seven or eight percent mm-hmm. is what I was told. Do you have any idea how many people in the brokerage firms were involved in this kind of business? No, I don't, I'd only be guessing. Yeah, okay. Only 12,000.